Hey everyone, welcome to the show, um, and welcome as well if you're watching at home on our live streams. I hope you're having a fantastic time. Uh, my name's Chris, I'm here from Eurogamer, and I'm about to introduce Paul from Fair Better Games to talk to you about Sun of Skies. But first, a trailer. Hello. Can you all hear me all right? Hi, I'm Paul. I'm the uh, CEO of Failbetter Games. Uh, Failbetter made, if you haven't heard of us, um, Fallen London, the web browser game, uh, and Sun of Sea, uh, which is a game where you pilot a Victorian steamship uh, across a giant underground lake full of monsters. Uh, anyone here played Sun of Sea? <laughs> cool, this will make a lot more sense. Uh, we're now making Sun of Skies, which is uh, a game where you pilot a flying train uh, across a nightmarish, uncaring cosmos full of monsters. So it's kind of a sequel. Uh, I'm going to talk today about what's changed between the two games um, and the challenges we faced uh, improving the design uh, of Sun of Sea without sacrificing what made the game work for people. Uh, and uh, we have a couple of surprise announcements at the end. So uh, if you're watching on Twitch, stay tuned. So first off, um, I'm going to talk about the world of Sun of the Skies, the high wilderness. So it's the turn of the century, it's 1905. The British Empire has colonized the stars. Now in Sun of the Sea, there was a, a stargate of sorts called the Avid Horizon uh, that led to a place called the high wilderness. And uh, you could actually go through it at the end of the game, but you got a very, very brief glimpse of what was there. Um, so our first job really was to sit down and decide what was on the other side. Um, we wanted to take uh, a period approach. We wanted something that felt appropriate to the, uh, the Fall in London universe. Um, so this was our initial steer. Uh, what the Victorians might have imagined space to be if they'd had way too much laudanum. So we started out by looking at uh, science fiction that was written before space travel, um, sometimes long before space travel. So we looked at C.S. Lewis, uh, the Planetary Romance series, uh, we looked at Edgar Rice Burroughs, Martian Adventures, Jules Verne, obviously, who actually died in 1905, the year the game was set in. Um, and we looked at H.G. Wells. Wells was particularly interesting. Um, Wells wrote a book called The First Man in the Moon. Uh, and in his vision of the moon, uh, the moon is a jungle of incredibly rapidly growing plants um, and sort of terrifying fungus. And it's inhabited by sentient insect creatures who farm giant maggoty things called moon calves. Well, this is very cool. And you compare that with what's actually on the moon, you can see why we went for the less scientific approach. Um, the way you treat space in a game, and in any media really, uh, it can be about constraint uh, or it can be about possibility. So if you take uh, 2001 um, or The Expanse or any, um, any sort of hard off-planet sci-fi, um, those are constraint-based. The environment is a constraint. You can't breathe, it's empty, it's lethal, uh, it's silent and dark. And these stories, they build their structure and their characters around these constraints. And they're very good for it. But um, what we needed was something different. We needed a, a possibility space. So it was somewhere that could feasibly hold the things that we do. So devils and rubbery men and pet pangolins, uh, a mushroom that wears a monocle and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to show you a bit of video of how it turned out, if we can. Yay! So uh, this, this is the high wilderness. Um, we pretty quickly stopped talking internally about space as a thing, uh, and we started talking about the heavens instead. 
So the idea was that this was a mythical space. It was a place of ancient ruins. Oh, hang on, hang on, come back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so it's not like regular Kubrick space. There's air, it's very cold. You might last 15 minutes without a sky suit. Um, but it's extremely, aggressively, horribly alive. There's lots of stuff in there. There's plants that breed on other plants. There's parasitic creatures. Um, everything's trying to uh, one-up everything else. And of course, there are monsters and pirates. And, and the stars themselves are not giant balls of gas. They are sentient creatures. They're judgments. They're alive. And they control the rules of the universe. OK, so I'm going to whack us on. So into this, into this environment, we add the Victorians. Uh, and the Victorians being the Victorians, they take one look at it and they go, oh, we'll have some of that. Um, so we have a conflict between this sort of uh, vast, uncaring cosmos and the rapacious, uh, can-do spirit of the Victorian Empire. Uh, and by the time the player turns up, there's also a civil war going on uh, between sort of frontier settlements who want freedom and the might of, of London. And as the player, you can pick a side, you can stay neutral, you can play them off against each other, whatever you want to do. So this is you. Who are you in Sun the Skies? Uh, you can be anybody you want to be, basically. Um, Avatar creation has moved on a bit since Sun the Sea. Um, those of you who've played it might remember you could choose from a series of little Victorian cameos. Uh, now we let you create your own uh, from a sort of a, a scratch bag of ingredients. Um, as before, your gender is entirely your own business. Uh, what you choose is a term of address. Um, this is something that's been very important to us and our players over the years. Uh, and we're committed to the idea of just letting people role play as whatever they feel like. Uh, so Skies has got a nice wide range of potential terms. You can see some of them there. Most of them are just non-gendered. Um, we also give captains a choice of histories. Uh, this is the sort of uh, this is your final character sheet before you go into the game. Uh, so you can be a soldier or a poet or an academic or a priest or a sailor. And some of these have vague connections with the last games of Sun the Sea and Fallen London, but. You don't have to play it either, really. So, reading and atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere we're aiming for in Skies is, I think, the intersection between horror and whimsy. Um, this is a world where you might conceivably scrub off your own skin uh, in order to rid yourself of nightmares, uh, or a world where you might find a giant eyeball growing in the crook of your elbow. Uh, but it's also a world where you can get a really nice cup of tea. So those two things you know, coexist together. And text has always been uh, very central in how we tell these stories. Uh, but up until now, it's been quite separated from the experience of play itself. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to bring it into the world. Um, Sun the Sea, you may remember, has a logbook that uh, gives you a little bit of your captain's history and your thoughts, and it sits at the bottom left of the screen. Um, and what we did was we took that logbook and we shoved it into the game. And I can show you some video of that, I hope. There we go. Um, <laughs> this actually came about from people really enjoying the trailer of Sun the Sea, where we put the text uh, on the screen and then playing the game and going, oh, I want the second on the screen. Um, it started out as a really simple system, but it turns out we can use it for pretty much anything we want. Um, so we can use it for very simple stuff, like uh, tutorials and fuel warnings and so on. Uh, we can convey information about the world to the player from their captain, if you like, because initially the captain kind of knows more than the player does. Um, your captain's personal thoughts, your crew's reactions to what they see around them. Officers will comment on your current situation if you've managed to recruit a few of them. Um, it's basically, it's extremely reactive. It can be tailored to the player circumstances, where they are, what they're doing, how close to terrible death they are, uh, and other of these factors. So it's kind of a reach to say this, but I've been thinking of it internally as uh, like a text version of the Bastion narrator. Uh, so it will, give you, it will give you a message that's appropriate to your, to your time. OK, so I'm going to talk about design a bit. This is a core loop. This is actually the Sunless Sea core loop. Um, so what happens here is you start out at Fallen London, always. You head out way, way, way out east. You might have a fight on the way. You might visit a port or two, play a few stories. Somewhere around here, you're finding that you're running very low on fuel or supplies. 
uh, or your terror is getting very high, and so you have to go all the way back to fallen London and try and survive. I'm not lit. I'm gonna go uh, and try and survive. Um, now, this is a good loop. Um, it's extremely good at building tension um, because the consequences are so high. If you die here, you're right back there. But when you get to mid-game, late-game, it's a bit of a slog because you're constantly having to go in and out and back. It's not particularly respectful uh, of the player's time. So this is a core loop from Sun the Skies, which looks like a flower, which is nice. Um, so the difference here is we have four smaller regions, uh, and they are circular. Uh, and the hub where you do things like repair your ship and try and uh, knock your terror down and so on and so forth is always in the center. Um, so what you can do is if you want to head up north, and then you decide you're going to come down southwest, you can stop in at your hub on the way, refill. So the loop is shorter. It's still quite fraught. Um, but that distance is really important because the kind of gameplay we're talking about, narrative roguelike. Um, so Sun the Sea was kind of an experiment here. Uh, we tried to meld two extremely different game styles together. Um, and the way we did that was by using a legacy mechanic. So uh, when you died in Sun the Sea, uh, you passed on some traits and some information to your daughter or your son or your apprentice or you know, something like that. But the story essentially restarted every single time. Um, and the game also really de-emphasized saving uh, in favor of a kind of Iron Man approach. You could actually save it. It just wasn't very obvious. Now, this again had some good consequences. Um, death felt very meaningful, which is obviously really important in a, in a roguelike. Uh, and it added a great deal of tension. And it was satisfying, I think, for, uh, for players who really got into the game uh, to control a long lineage of captains who gradually improved as they went along. However, uh, the legacies themselves were pretty mean. Um, and it was quite dispiriting sometimes to start again from scratch. Um, and that was exacerbated, I think, because the game didn't really acknowledge uh, that you had started again. Uh, the story essentially restarted. Um, a particular example of this, one of the main quests in the game is to find your father's bones. Um, but if you're on your seventh sea captain, and that captain is the great, 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 great granddaughter of the first captain who started the father's bones quest, it's not entirely clear whose bones you're supposed to be rescuing at that point. So uh, we've reworked um, our legacies to make them a bit more generous. So you always keep ship. Uh, you lose one item of equipment, uh, which is vastly more generous than some of the sea, but somehow feels meaner. Um, this is something that comes up in playtesting. People get really upset about it. But you know, we kind of like that. So. The other thing is that legacies will acknowledge the influence of your previous captain on the world. Uh, so you'll get some gifts from people you've, uh, you've made an impression upon, uh, and stories that you've taken part on will be acknowledged. Also, you have a bank. Anything you stick in the bank prior to dying, your next captain can inherit. So you can actually set up, if you feel, you know, if you feel the hand of doom on you, uh, you can set up an inheritance for your next captain. However, if you still don't fancy that, uh, we have autosave front and center right at the beginning of the game. You can go straight into Merciful. So, narrative leveling up. This is a new idea. This is something we're really excited about. Um, so as with a traditional RPG, uh, you gain experience points, you level up, you put those uh, experience points into stats and so on. But also, uh, you get something called a facet. You can choose a facet. Uh, I'm going to show you some. OK, so this is our current level up screen. Um, facets are snippets of your captain's past. Uh, like a, a story version of a perk, for instance. Um, and each one comes with its own decision. So what happens is that you continue to build the history of your captain uh, throughout the game. However, it's not just your past. Actions you take in the game will create special facets called deeds. Uh, so like a really simple example might be you had a big fight, uh, you got down to hull 10, uh, but you made it back to port alive. And next time you level up, you'll find that there's a, a special deed just for that saying uh, you know, a narrow escape or something like that. Uh, and some deeds will relate to the actions of your previous captain. So for instance, 
Uh, if your last captain happened to, say, eat all their crew, uh, then you will find that there's a special deed for you when you level up uh, that acknowledges this horrifying, bloodthirsty past. Uh, right, art direction. Sorry, I'm zooming through loads of stuff here. Um, so I, I was technically the art director of Sun and Sea by virtue of drawing all the pictures. Um, but we were kind of halfway through development uh, before I really knew what art direction was and what it entailed. Um, fortunately, because the game is set in a very simple, straightforward location, uh, having a coherent art direction Sun and Sea was not hard. It was kind of, you know, rocky and bluey green. Um, skies, a bit more complicated. So first off, we've got four regions rather than one. Uh, and even within those regions, there's a vastly greater variety uh, in the environment. So we've had to create sort of fungal wastelands, pagan ruins, uh, bustling cities, an artificial sun, the land of the dead, uh, fairy tale. I mean, it goes on. But all the time while we do that, we have to try and maintain this sort of sense of a coherent single world. Uh, and then on top of that, we decided to add parallax. Uh, and I can show you some video of that. There we go. Uh, so this isn't just about the pretty, although it's definitely partly about the pretty. Um, it's also a key component in, I think, in immersion in the game. And particularly this kind of environment, it really sells the idea of scale uh, and that sense of cosmic nothingness of how insignificant you are next to all these giant things. Uh, so yeah, a really important component of cosmic horror. Um, but of course, not only are we building four regions rather than one, we've also got to make each region five times because there's multiple levels. So we, uh, we hired another artist, which we should have done years ago. Really. Yeah. Right, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, quick bit of design stuff. Uh, so this is, an, uh, this is an area where we actually benefited from going back to um, old design. Uh, when we finished the reach and we put it out in early access, the reach is the, uh, the first region of the game. Uh, people liked it, but they felt uh, that it, it felt a little empty uh, and that it was quite hard to find stuff. Uh, and there was actually a ton of stuff in there, but, mm. but it was very widely separated. And it was easy to spend um, several minutes wandering through the fog, not finding anything, which is kind of frustrating. Um, so we gave the player a scout, a little bat that could fly around um, and find stuff. Uh, but that didn't make for a terribly interesting decision. It was just a question of, your bat has found something, here is an icon on the map, point yourself in that direction, off you go. So we needed to make the actual moment-to-moment -moment business of traveling around the world more interesting. So what we did was, uh, we just shoved loads of rocks in it. Um, we redesigned the whole reach um, on the principle of you should always be able to see something, preferably something you can hit, something that will block your path. Um, and this allowed us to make labyrinths. Uh, this is the, uh, the Traitor's Woods section. Um, now, this is immediately much, much more engaging because your journeys have to be planned to a degree. Um, and decisions have real weight here. So if I want to get to the Regent's Grave, much quicker to go left, but there's a big old pirate base there. So I have to be ready for a fight. Or I could take the long way around, around Somerset Camp. So ideally, as you get to know this map, you sort of become sort of inured to the psychogeography of it, and you understand which way you want to go. And it just makes for more interesting decisions. Um, plus, it also makes the world feel much more atmospheric and, obsess and oppressive. Obsessive? Um, because you're hemmed in a lot of the time. And we did a lot with, with the foreground to make that feel sort of even worse. This is all coming in the next update, by the way, if we have any early access players in the house. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, the other area where we've made major changes is combat. Um, before I talk about this, I don't know if there are devs in the room, I expect there are, but the thing with any combat implementation at all is that it's a beast. It's a complete beast and it will take over your entire development cycle if you don't watch yourself. Um, so that's fine if that's fundamentally what your game is about. Uh, but we're making a game about exploration and about atmosphere and about narrative and also about combat. So what we had to do was we had to set ourselves a very clear goal. Um, so a bit of history. Uh, Sun and Sea Combat actually changed mid-development. I say mid-development, kind of really late in development. Uh, we were working on a turn-based model for ages. Um, but it wasn't working out well for us. And so we changed it for um, 
uh, this real-time system that you can see here, which is based on uh, timing warm-ups and auto-aim. Um, and it was fine. It was functional. Uh, it was tense at times. Uh, it felt part of the world. But I don't think many of our players would describe it as their favorite part of the game. Uh, so that goal with Skies was to make something simple and fun uh, that anybody could pick up and that we could then build on. Now, getting that actual foundation right was probably one of the greatest challenges we've had. Uh, but we're pretty pleased with how it's working now. I'm going to show you some more video of it. So this is Sun the Skies Combat. Um, lots of changes here. First off, you are in direct control of your firing. Um, you can dodge. You can strafe. Dodging, strafing, same thing. Um, you are facing enemies that move a great deal faster and that are more maneuverable, and you have a quite floaty movement model. Um, and all these, enemies, <laughs> all these enemies have their own personalities. We just saw a star-maddened explorer there uh, who we decided was sufficiently maddened that they would, uh, they would just ram you at every opportunity. Uh, but some of them are much more standoffish, depending on their, sort of, their personalities. Um, and then on top of that, we have a very simple system for heat management. That's this bar down here. Uh, so all your weapons produce heat. Um, so, and if you overheat, you can no longer dodge. Uh, and if you fire your weapons while overheated, you take damage. So it's worth keeping an eye on. OK, so last thing to talk about is survival, which I'm going to, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, our focus in survival uh, has always been about, well, it's about anecdote generation. Uh, we like to write about interesting failures. Uh, we're much more into having horrible, interesting things happening to players uh, than we are in empowering them. Because there's obviously plenty of games that empower players. Uh, but what works for us is near misses, disasters caused by the player's hubris or greed, uh, spiraling butterfly effect chaos disasters where one false move leads you inexorably towards a whole mess of trouble. Uh, and this is the stuff that makes good anecdotes. And we see this in our reviews. Um, Steam reviews for Sun and Sea and for Sun and Skies, very often written in the first person. Um, and they're usually something on the lines of, well, Captain Featherstone made one small mistake outside New Winchester, and now I am chewing on the femur of the last member of my crew, uh, and my ship is on fire, and I've offended the Elder Gods, and, uh, and this is great, 10 out of 10. So, survival in detail. <laughs> um, this is not vastly changed from Sun and Sea because it just works. Uh, so, as before, you have to manage fuel and supplies and your crew's terror uh, in order to survive. And if you let them, any of them get out of hand, then horrible, interesting, horrible things start to happen. Uh, and usually, those interesting, horrible things are not death, at least not immediately. Um, so if you run out of fuel, for instance, uh, you might be able to burn the contents of your hull to keep moving. Uh, or if you happen to be steering a locomotive that was designed by devils, you could burn souls to keep moving. Uh, or you could sacrifice a member of your crew to a particularly capricious god in order to keep moving. Or you could just burn a member of your crew for fuel to keep moving. Uh, and if you run out of supplies, well, there are Lots of things that you can eat at a pinch. Um, crew, rabbits, pets, the whole, you know. And the thing with this is the game has to be fair. Um, so if someone is playing the game and they're really, really good at managing their stats, um, and uh, you know, they're an efficient fighter, and they plan their journeys very carefully, they're going to miss a lot of fun. Uh, because a lot of this stuff is aimed at people who screw up. Um, so, the way the game is structured, the way the game is written, is about temptation. Um, so a lot of our content is about encouraging the player to push it just that little bit too far, uh, to go out and investigate that wreck, when, uh, that wreck, that wreck, to investigate that wreck uh, when their hull is low, um, and so on. Uh, right. So we've added one thing uh, to survival. We've added a new stat. Uh, it's called nightmares. Um, we had some fun naming it, actually. It was initially conditioned, and then it was sanity for a bit. But what it actually tracks uh, is your player's dreams, your captain's dreams. Uh, so as you, uh, as you journey through the world and horrible things happen to you, you start having dreams. Um, and those dreams gradually start to invade your waking life. 
uh, and they will eventually kill you if you are not careful. Um, but they are some of the best content in the game. They're really nasty. Uh, and we have uh, multiple tracks of them, so uh, different captains will have different dream tracks. You won't see the same story all the time. Okay, so that is my stuff. I've now got a couple of announcements. So um, first one is a release date. 31st of January, 2009. We said we were going to do it in January, and that is when we're going to do it. It's the last day of January, but it's still January. However, um, to celebrate this momentous announcement, we've got a bit of a surprise for you. So <sighs> we've been working with RPG designers, uh, Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor, uh, and we've created with them a free pen and paper RPG in the Fallen London universe. It's called Skyfarer. It looks like this. Um, so this is a tabletop game set in the high wilderness. Uh, why am I putting that down? Uh, and you play as the crew, not the captain, uh, of one of our locomotives. So you can be a gunner or a quartermaster or a signaler or even a mascot if that takes your fancy. You could be the inadvisably big dog or the perfect pangolin. Um, the captain is played by the GM, uh, and the captain has been struck down with some terrible misfortune which the GM decides. Uh, and the crew has to band together to survive. So Skyfarer is free. Uh, you can download it right now here. Uh, or you can pick up a copy, physical copy, from Haley over there. Haley did the design on this, and it is so, so cool. You should see the character sheet. It's amazing. Uh, so we've got a bunch of those to give away if you want to, uh, if you want to grab one on your way out. Uh, and did we get the setup? Cool. Okay, so one person in this auditorium um, has got a business card taped to the underside of their chair. Is it you? Do we have a winner? Is it one of the chairs that nobody's sitting in? The suspense is intolerable. Sorry? Chair leg. Chair leg. Oh, okay. It's the chair leg, apparently. This is great. I could just keep changing the locations and everyone bows to me. Anybody? <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> so um, that was a deluxe edition with dice and correspondence sigils and other cool things. We will, we will work out a fair way of uh, assigning it in a minute. OK, so that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Um, Fair bit of games. These are our title leads. We are on the floor at the moment. Uh, you can find us down by the entrance. Come play Sun the Skies. It's really good. Um, and thank you very much. I'll see you next year. <laughs>